Hey everybody, this is Jeremiah Craig coming at you for another Ask the Bootmaker. And we have a very special session today because I'm talking with a custom bootmaker right here in Massachusetts. This is going to be so much fun. That's right. Today I'm talking with La Saboteuse, which is French for female bootmaker. Here she is, Saboteuse Bespoke, coming in. Let's do it. Let's kick it off. Hey, Jeremiah. How are you? Great. Was I saying that right? La Saboteuse? You were. It's Saboteuse. And it, it actually yes. a bootmaker would be a female bootmaker. A butcher. Oh, okay. But, um, but I like the story behind the history of the word, and so I, that's what I picked as my name. Can you tell us a little bit about the story behind the word? Sure. There's a couple good stories, you know, word people argue them, but this particular one was a sabo. Actually, I have one here. A sabo is one of those big wooden farmer shoes from old fashioned times, like Dutch shoes. This one happens to be French. And that's made out of wood. Made out of wood. And Jeez. these artisans, when the first small factories uh, came to be, these artisans felt like their livelihood was being threatened. So they went and they threw their wooden shoes in the, the mill gears and tried to wreck it. So then the word sabotage and saboteur came to be. And oh. Female. So I like the, the story. I, I'm a story person. <laughs> yeah, me too. I absolutely love the story behind things. So do you, you like that part of the story the best? Do you see yourself as a, a person who sabotages anything like uh, societal norms or just you being in this trade yourself how do you view that i guess the spirit of that story of these artisans saying you know hey your your factory life affects our livelihood and our craft and so in a way i guess i'm sabotaging the idea of mass production but not not really <laughs> <laughs> well i think there always needs to be people who do the hands-on work from start to finish. So thanks for being one of those folks who's continuing the trade on. Thank you, thanks. It's important. Can you give us, it is, it is really important. Can you give us a little bit of an origin story for you as a boot maker? Sure, sure. Um, I, I grew up in Swampscott, that's just north of Austin, which has this rich history of footwear that I about often, but I had no idea about it when I grew up there. It's it's like obsolete, and nobody really talks about it. And um, I, my dad is from France, and my mom's American, so I sort of have this. We were back and forth between both places a lot. I have a very dual culture uh, mentality, and but I grew up going to school here. And after high school, I went to um, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, which is an art and design school and majored in architecture and about i want to say my junior year one of the teachers said all of you should go out and get a job in construction this summer don't work for an architect you're not going to get ahead of the game you should know how things are made you'll be better for it so i did that and by the end of that summer i knew i would never not work with my hands i loved building and i've always been really hands-on and um so you know i finished architecture school it was a fantastic education that really could apply to anything and as soon as I graduated, I just got a job in a shop building trade show, show booths and moved on from there to a furniture making shop and then a cabinet making shop for a little while and ended up at a model building shop in France for a few years where I learned to work really, really well. And, um, you know, small scale, but, but good habits, good fine working habits. And um, at all these places, I would learn great skills that can apply, but I, I didn't love what I was making. Like I didn't love that I was putting out another plastic model of a mini mall or something like that. And uh, and I all along the way love shoes. Like you know your watchers and you. Like I love shoes. I love boots. But I didn't know that that was something people really did. I just it wasn't something I considered because I just didn't know. I didn't know anybody that did it. And somebody told me about uh, Cordwainers College in London <laughs> that had like taught traditional shoemaking, and it was like this oh my God, this is out there and I have to go. And I ended up going for a, like an intensive one year course taught over a couple months in the summer and thought at the end, I can be a shoemaker. Perfect. Like all my skills are coming together. And at the end they said, 
you know, you've got a good foundation, but you really can't do this craft without apprenticing with somebody for years and years. It's so labor intensive and so there's so much knowledge to learn. And um, it took me a while to find somebody, but the only person I could find was a Western bootmaker in Massachusetts when I moved back here. And I thought, oh, I'll add Western bootmaking to the wheelhouse of skills that I picked up. And it's like bootmaking found me because it really was the perfect marriage of everything that I love about making and designing. And I will do it for the rest of my life, I'm sure. I have no, no plans of moving on. It, can you tell me a little bit about the apprentice uh, program that you did with the bootmaker in Massachusetts? Sure. Um, I, I, he's a very private person, so I try to respect his privacy, and I don't want to delve into his story, which is his tale. But I found about about him through a Boston Globe article that was showcasing his boots and that you know these beautiful handmade boots, and I contacted him, and he you know, welcomed me out to his shop and it was like seeing a dream realized. And I spent a whole day with me just telling me his story and telling me all that goes into boot making in a very abbreviated version and, you know, showing me leathers and tools and things which are a little different than shoemaking. The school that I went to really taught um, traditional like men's bespoke like Oxford's and Darby shoemaking. And there are similarities, but there are a lot of differences. And we talked and talked and talked and after after I went home and you know thought like God I really want to learn from this man I I called him back and asked and he just said a firm no like no he was it and I to be honest I didn't know what I was asking I was asking a lot I didn't understand that this was such a task which now I do but he um, he said no he was you know he's very set in his ways he's very private he likes working alone there aren't really established programs it's hard to become a bootmaker um, you know I think. I, a little bit easier if you live in the Southwest or in Texas where there's more people that do it, but it's still a big ask to have someone take you on and teach you all this knowledge and skills and be over your shoulder. You know, they're not making while they're doing the teaching. Right. But, but Massachusetts has this great program that supports traditional arts and it's called an apprenticeship program. So I approached him with that and said, you know, you could be paid take me on and he said nope nope <laughs> no interest don't want any part of it don't want any part of the state like just you know i'm happy you're out there thanks no thanks and um a year after that i was getting pretty desperate there's nobody around here and i have kids it's not like i'm upwardly mobile they they have schools and we have strong roots here um and my husband is in the navy reserves he's a cb the construction battalion and he got deployed so he left us for a year and, you know, I don't know if you know anybody that has been through that. It's incredibly difficult. I certainly didn't do any boot making or shoe making for a year. I was just trying to stay alive and I would keep my kids afloat. And mm -hmm. then he got deployed again to first time to Iraq, second time to Afghanistan. And wow. he was another year. And when that happened, I last ditch desperation called this boot maker again and said, you know, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. <laughs> And please, please take me on. And it turns out he was a Navy medic in Vietnam. And when he heard that this had happened to us, he was like, all right, I'll take you on. And he, for three years, taught me so much, you know, just wildly generous with his time and knowledge. And I am forever, forever in his debt. That is a great story of just your dedication to trying to get into a craft. I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize that when you're chasing your dream, there's going to be people who say no. And even later in the future, it's just about dedication and persistence to, to actually get what you want in life. Did, did you find that that was something that uh, you had to deal with is just keep on going? I've always been somebody who's very determined and I know what I like. I might not be able to articulate it until after the fact, like this is why I needed to do that or this is why I sought this direction or that direction. But I, I have a lot of confidence in it always. Um, you know, my thanks to my parents, they raised us really well to be confident people. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm a difficult person to take no for an answer. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> but something like 
I'm thinking about your, your questions ahead of time. Something that strikes me, having grown up here in New England, um, I, I've always just thought of school. You know, I didn't, I, not, along the way, I never really thought you learn something by going and asking somebody to teach you that. It's always been like, what school can I go to? There's got to be a school somewhere. You know, it might not be here, but it might be in England. It might be in Italy. It might be in Texas. It might be not, and didn't really think of that, that option of finding somebody who has knowledge that they can transfer to you. And, and I think that that's an important message to get out there, that there are a lot of disciplines, that that is the best way to learn a craft and to carry on a tradition. Without a doubt. Yeah. I, I would say that the apprenticeship like program will probably be coming back in the years to come, especially after this pandemic, because the less people that you can be around while learning a trade, um, one, it probably saves a lot of money because you're not spending tens of thousands of dollars going to a school to get a piece of paper, but you're actually coming out with uh, experience that is, is, is dedicated to that craft. So I think that's a, an awesome message. Um, I have a question about your boots and the art background. Um, this is actually a question from Barry on Instagram, who I believe is watching right now. Thanks for the question, Barry. Uh, he had a question about your boots being more art than boot, or how does your art fuse with boot making? So, so I think of my practice as t there's, there's two separate parts to it. Three, really. Mm -hmm. So two in the making. And one is that I'm a, a custom or bespoke boot maker, that I make boots for people. Um, my kind of niche in that area is that I did go to art school. I did, I'm a longtime designer. So I, I will come up with something in collaboration with the person that is, that is unique. I, I don't really use existing patterns. And, and then there's kind of a story and a development on how that design comes to be. That is separate from these art pieces that I make. So I also make these boots like the exacto blade boots that are in that picture that are are intended as works of art. I don't make them very often. They're something that I just have to get out once in a while. You know, they're kind of stirring around in my brain for a long time and they slowly come to be for whatever reason. And that's totally separate. And I'm able to do that if I'm between orders, if I really feel like working on something, I'll do it at night after I've put in the time that I need to on my actual customer work. And, and it's separate. So it's not like I'm out there, hire me to make some crazy art wearable boots. I mean, you could, but nobody has yet. Um, mm -hmm. I also apply for artist grants, so that's a little bit of leeway. If I get a grant as an actual practicing artist, then I'm getting paid for the time it takes to work on that type of work. So those are kind of the two separate and distinct areas, both in my brain and, and how I organize my time. And the third is, talking about the history of shoemaking and tying it into modern day practices and the history of footwear in New England, the history of workshop spaces and architecture that goes back to my kind of architecture school roots. And, and the more people that know how artisans work and how boots are made, how shoes are made, the better it is for our craft. And so I do spend a lot of time going out to different, whether it's historical societies or like family days and out and just do demonstrations. I've got a, like a little portable kit I bring with me, show people how boots are inseamed and you know, what, what a lap is, that kind of stuff. That's cool. That's got to create some interest in some younger folks to maybe pursue this as a trade themselves. I hope so. I keep thinking of me that I grew up here, had no idea shoes were made here when it was, you know, the most shoes in the entire world were made here at one time. And it, how much I would have thought differently from an early age if I knew that that was something that people did. And, you know, kids are the best. Kids questions. And and then I'll, I get, just because of the history of here, a lot of the older people that come around, like really elderly people will say, I worked in the ballet point shoe factory in Lynn, or I worked in the women's slipper factory doing heels in Haverhill. And it's just, it's awesome. It, it's, how would you know and be able to talk to people like this if you weren't here? Yeah, without a doubt. The great, there's great stories there. Do you find that when you're making the more art-leaning projects for footwear that you bring any of the things that you learn from those pro projects into the boots that you make for your customers? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I put out a few things on my table. I'll flip the camera around just so I could talk about my process. Yes, please. See if it goes around. So just for an example, this is, you know, my favorite pair of boots are these Smith and Anthony boots that had the face on them. But the client sent me this picture. He's a uh, stove refurbisher. And he said, I want a pair of boots with this on it. And, you know, my heart fell when I first saw it. I was like, how that hell am I going to put that on a pair of boots? And then I thought, yeah. you know, <laughs> maybe stitch, fancy stitching could be the hair. And I tried that and it looked terrible. And <laughs> so I ended up, you know, going back to like my, my artist roots, like, okay, this was cast. This is something this, this guy in the 1800s made out of clay and they cast it. So I'm going to start there. So I made a little piece of wax, cast wax, and I carved out the face and I made a mold. And I researched this, um, these old leather working techniques called clear bouillie, where you'd put leather in boiling water and then put it in a mold and it would harden. And I started wow. making tiles, like all these tiles. So this was one of the rejects, but it was a better reject. I don't know if you can see. Wow, that's awesome. That's a reject? That was a reject. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it, well, you'll see. I, uh, I have another reject that's much better, too. But so then this, this was one of the like patterns on a stove. So I started trying to translate that into stitch patterns and ended up making him. This is a kind of the practice sample boot I made to show him. But this was, you see the stitch pattern, which is really, you know, the stitching is kind of a traditional Western boot technique, but done in a slightly different way. And then mm -hmm. there's the tiles on the front of the boot. The, so both boots had that fire fiend from the 1800s on them. Wow. So that's, that's kind of my process. Here's a little bit more traditional one. This woman wanted her initials. And that's, you know, very typical in Western boots to get an inlay initial. So, uh, mm -hmm. And this wisteria flower theme. So instead of just making a, a flower... I took some, I took a picture of wisteria leaves on a window and here were the shadows on the wind on, you can see my screen of my window there. And I turned that into an inlay pattern and then did, did the embroidery. Here was a sample piece where I did some kind of like old French hand embroidery techniques along with traditional Western boot inlay. And then here, here are those boots. So it's kind of a wow. mix. Like my, my art practice and the boot making skills I've learned really complement each other and come together in ways that I find exciting and the people that are a good match for my skills are, are happy with too. So. Yeah, that is some great work. I, I love your process and thanks for sharing that because that I've never seen anything like that before. That's super interesting. Um, taking it the other way around, has boot making changed your perspective on art in any ways? So, so boot, boot making is this, you know, 30 to 40. I mean, you could, a lot of skills that are really hard to do well and just practice every day, trying to improve, being, you know, trying to seek out information, how other people do things all the time. I'm, I'm always improving these skills that really, Time. So I'm, I've, I've been making boots for seven years now, and I still consider myself a beginner. And the, but the things I can do with my hands, I always love this when I talk to people from the art school I went to. I was like, none of you can do this. Even the architects that have been working 30 years, like I have something in my hands that all of us who make, whether it's, you know, fine woodworking or embroidery or boot making, have this connection between our brain and our hands that makes us able to do something that you're only able to do with all that time dedicated to, to really improving and, and I don't want to use the word mastering at all because I don't think anybody can ever truly master you're always getting better and the pieces that I do like these like those razor blade boots I couldn't have made even three years ago because I just didn't those skills have refined themselves to a point where that piece of artwork is so much finer executed because of the skills that I have right now and they reflect me at this point in time that I'm I'm like proud of and grateful for and and so yeah it's definitely affected the quality of my work I'll turn around these are those boots so for instance on the heel slide you can see there's a lot of hand embroidery on the heel slide mm -hmm. that's really that's really like beautiful I think that you know that that spine 
catches the light in a way that it's hard to see inside the boot, but that makes it look like a spine. And to me that I couldn't have done that a while ago. And I, you know, this was an exercise in patience of sewing all these sharp knives onto a boot. But at the same time, it's a boot that's done with all the skills of fitted to a foot, you know, that all these things, like, but as an art piece that can't be worn, there's kind of like a, a they're made to start a discussion and uh -huh. talk about all those things. So yeah, the boot making skills have absolutely informed my work because this piece wouldn't have existed five years ago. And what is the story and discussion around those boots that you want to happen? Attention. Yeah. So when I worked in that model building shop in France, uh, we had a very verbally abusive boss who it was a small shop there were 19 of us in there and he was the king and a dictator and really it, uh yeah it was quite an experience because this guy was just so a piece of work and <laughs> throwing things screaming you know just nuts so i worked with a lot of exacto blades because i'm a model maker and i didn't know what to do with them because he didn't like seeing anything thrown away like we weren't allowed to throw away wadded up paper with paint on it like like you we were like taking garbage home so he wouldn't yell and i started saving these blades over the course of two years i saved hundreds and hundreds of blades that i was afraid to get rid of <laughs> so when i moved i just took them with me and it seemed like silly at the time but i was like i couldn't let them go and all these years later i i kept thinking like i sewed them like sequins on a piece of leather it was like you know they're sort of like fish scales like we make boots out of different types of skins and scales and, you know, just making these correlations. And at the same time, the process was really important. Trying to sew with such deliberate movement that I wouldn't cut myself was really part of the process. And all these things were just things to start discussion about, you know, this is what it feels like to live in an abusive situation, even if it's your boss at work, but you spend more than half your day at work. And for years, it weighs on you. <laughs> but you can, turn it into something beautiful. I mean, that's what you just did. I mean, even though you have that experience, you're taking what you had from it and you're able to show it off in a really cool way because that that experience makes up part of who you are today. Yeah, and, and then boots too. Like think about it, boots are symbols of strength and protection, you know, protecting your leg from things and really your, your feet from hard and heavy danger in certain ways. And you know, what does it mean to, to wear a boot? and you know, if you put this on, like I always fi pictured it as armor in a way, like the Game of Thrones wasn't far off. Like I'm putting on this armor to keep that back from hurting me anymore. And, you know, it's, even though it's years and years ago, it's that stuff doesn't leave you. And um, there are just a lot of things going on with that. I can't fully explain it at this point in time, I'm, but that's where I was coming from when I made it. I, I love it. I think it's such, it, it's, it, you look at it first and it kind of takes you back like, What's the point of this? But then you're, you're just drawn to it. And the more that you look at it, just the more enamored I feel like. I've never been enamored. Like, I just want to look at that and be like, what is this? I'm just so fascinated by this. Like, it looks good, but those are knives. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I love hearing people's feedback on them because that, that's the point, too, is to, to talk and see what somebody else takes away from it, what their experience brings to which is a lot about... If you think about Western boots being a, a reflection of your, your character or how you see yourself or what's important to you, it's like you're putting this kind of vulnerability out there the same way. And sometimes you hide it with your pants and other times you declare it by shotgunning. And, you know, those like talking about those themes, I just find fascinating, like the, the discussion and the, the points of view, the different points of view and people's different cultural experiences. And Yeah, and that's, that's something that comes up when I'm talking to bootmakers or just like other boot enthusiasts all the time is boots carry stories. As you wear them, it's like you get scuffs, you get scratches, you get cracks. Uh, they start to sag a little bit and you start to attach a story to those boots and you are coming at it from here's the story to begin with. And I think that is reflective of just the boot wearer in general because it's you're starting out with the story and then the story only gets deeper from there. So I think it's it's such a cool thing what you're doing. Thanks. Thanks. But you're working in New England, which isn't a 
really popular area for boots. Can you tell me a little bit about what it's like working up here in New England where, you know, we're really not known for cowboy boots? Sure. It's, um, it's definitely a different experience that I'm realizing the more Western boot makers that I meet. And I don't have the rich personal tradition and experience of boots and loving boots the way people do that, that grew up around it. And to me, part of the joy is discovering that and learning it more now. I, I did, but we have this, also have this really long standing tradition in footwear that, that gives me sort of a slightly different perspective, like discovering that too. Like when it's too cold to work in my shop, I go to the library and literally just look at stuff that's in the back room with the keyword boots or keyword shoe or shoemaker or shop or something. And I, I learned something new that definitely ties into this craft that we all share in different ways. Um, the boot maker that I trained with, when he was from Colorado, and when he moved here, he really thought his practice would suffer because of the things you're talking about. But it act, it didn't for him because there's a lot of money here. And the thing with custom boots and bespoke boots and individually designed boots is they cost a lot. So in the end, as far as having an active, viable practice, I think being here is an asset in some ways. But I also feel very isolated, and that bothers me both working alone in my shop and not having resources close by to go in, in person, like tactile and sit and talk and touch and discuss things with other boot makers. So I make an effort to go. I haven't as much as I want to, but I'm very excited about, you know, the, the older my kids get, the more free I am to travel, but that that'll be, you know, the next exciting chapter for me is connecting even more. And of course, Instagram and the internet has, brought me in contact with people that I never would have been otherwise. That's just such a valuable resource. Without a doubt. Let's, you mentioned your shop a little bit, so let's talk about that. It, you call it the 10 footer. Is it actually 10 feet? It's 11 by 14, so it's not 10 feet, but traditional 10 footers, which were the names for shoe and boot making shops in Massachusetts were almost all 12 by 12 feet. <laughs> okay. So I don't know why they were called 10 footers, but um, that's that's the name of them, what they were called. And there's a few around, you know, like now it's funny because each town in around greater Boston has like one that they renovated and they keep and as a historical memory of what used to be around here. But even I did find on one of these research trips and on a cold day, I found um, some a story from the 1960s about these couple 10 footers left in Lynn that the, the historical society wanted to put on the town common. And it was still so close to the time when people made shoes and it was badly seen, like Paul Krause had said, it was like the bottom of the barrel that they wouldn't let them put them on the town common because they thought it was, you know, like an embarrassment or something not great to be seen. And now we're 60 years removed from that. Everybody's renovating and putting them. So, so my husband and I built mostly him. He's a carpenter built mm -hmm. 10 footer uh, the back of our property so it's a replica of the kind of spaces that used to exist for footwear making except back then like eight guys would work in a space like this so i have wow i have a, a lot of space to myself <laughs> despite <laughs> the fact that it looks crowded and everybody says it looks small do you feel like you take inspiration from the fact that you built it to be the traditional 10 footer um in the work that you do? Yeah, you know, so, some of the ideas I have kicking around in my head are, are what back, I, I'm not like a reenactment maker. I, I don't aspire to do things just for the sake of, of historical practices. And I, and I don't mean to disparage that in any way. That's just not what right. I do. But there was something about those workspaces being one level on the ground, except in neighborhoods, among houses, among families, you know, kids are running through my yard. So all the kids that grow up in my neighborhood know that there's, that's something one can do when they grow up is work in a small shop. They're, they're accessible spaces and they feel good. Everybody loves the atmosphere of this shop or, or any artisan's shop. You know, you come in and it's this world of tools and, and visual excitement. And, you know, you could just talk and talk and talk and explain it, lots of questions from people. And there's just something about that type of accessibility to a space that helps maintain a craft, a living artisan craft. 
And, and that's definitely the case with my, my 10 footer, that whether it's somebody on Instagram who wants to know more about it or see more about it, or if it's somebody in my neighborhood that's lived on the street 70 years and never knew anybody else to make shoes or boots, comes and sits on my little deck here and hangs out and talks. Like it's, it's a valuable workspace in the way that the architecture helps sustain the craft. I love the thought that you put into, it seems like every, every step, not only the boots, but where you work, why you work there. It, it's, it's really inspirational, I feel like, to listen to. Um, you, you have so many stories about each and every aspect of it. Now, on your website, uh, you, 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 uh, you say that you're a French-American. Um, and I'm going to be switching things up a little bit here because I want to hear the story behind this. Has there been any like techniques that are specifically French that you've brought into boot making? Because you seem to be pulling things in from everywhere. I'd, I'd say so growing up with two cultures is it's I'm very lucky and I definitely like can switch between my American mentality and my French mentality and most of the time recognize which way I'm thinking. And I, I think that 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 is an asset to my work habits because I learned when I'm in French mode, the end game isn't making money. It's not being efficient the way it is in, a, in American work mode. So the end game is taking your time, taking all the time you need in the world, ignoring deadlines, ignoring, and it doesn't mean that, that you know, I come in late on things. I, it's just more the mentality of the process of when I'm working, doing something really well. And if it's not, like just this week, you know, I was talking with Paul Krauss a little bit. I was making counter covers and was unhappy with my sky job. And it's not unusable. It's not bad. But because I was unhappy with it, I just stopped, cut new ones, redid them. And this is not a viable business model in, in the United States. <laughs> but... But at, when you multiply that times 30 processes, but when I'm in my French mentality, I just do better work and, and, and I get pleasure and joy from just doing everything the best way I possibly can. And I learned those habits, both just growing up around my French family and my dad, who's a tool and die maker, but also by working there, by living and working there where the pace of everything is so much slower and you can discuss things ad nauseum. So, you know, I worked in a in an active, really profitable business at this model shop. But if there was a deadline and the truck arrived to get the model, somebody would go talk to the guy and say, like, go hang out with your friends till tomorrow because it's not done. Like, that wouldn't happen here. <laughs> and there was something about that, that priority on quality over speed or, or even quantity, if you want to get into production, then that I... I feel as an asset to me, even though I'm always broke and <laughs> it's okay because I, I prioritize something else. And that's definitely from my, my French side. Love it. Thank you. That's exactly the answer that I was hoping for. Something like that. I love the fact that you're like, have two sides, the American side and the French side. Um, that is incredible. Now, earlier on in the in, in our chat here, you said you don't use traditional stitch patterns. Now, in the cowboy boot world, there's stitch patterns that are in the public domain, which means the copyright or trademark has, um, has gone away, so they're freely available for everybody to use if they want to, but you don't even use that. What is the reason why you don't bring in some of these traditional stitch patterns that are in the public domain like other custom boot makers do? Well, I haven't yet, and so I don't want to say I never will. It's not, it's not like a manifesto I have, and okay. it may very well lead me there at some point. And I definitely use resources of, of you know, these books with old cowboy boot patterns, and I'm really drawn to the ones from the 30s and 40s, and even some of the 1800s, just single stitch patterns. Just like that's what I go to. And but every time I look at any old boot pattern. I think of the person who came up with it first. Somebody came up with that for a reason, the same way that I come up with the designs for the people that I'm making. Like they, there was a reason and, and it might've been function. It might've been, you know, why I need more fancy stitch lines because the glues weren't developed yet that would hold lining to the, 
to the outer part of the top, but you know, maybe it came from loving the thistle flower, like the boots I'm working on right now. And that's how that pattern emerged. But I think about like somebody, somebody came up with these at some time. And I definitely was, was trained by going to art school for five years of not taking somebody else's work. And I, and I can't stress enough that sometimes I say things that sound judgmental and I'm not a judgmental person. So I don't think that using a stitch pattern in the public domain is taking someone's work, but I, stress very much when I'm working, the things that give me pleasure and the things that feel right. And I do those things. And I, that just hasn't felt right to me yet. But I, I could very easily go in that direction at some point. Yeah, I feel a very similar way when it comes to cover music for myself. It's like, I don't have that connection to the song that somebody else wrote. Like it could be new. Sometimes they are older ones in the public domain, but if I can make that connection to a public domain song, then I will play it or perform it or maybe change it up a little bit. And I feel like music has a little bit more flexibility because you can then also change the way that you perform the song. Um, but I feel very similar to just cover music altogether. I just can't connect with it um, in a way that is meaningful to me, which is why I mainly perform a lot of my own stuff i i have to say i do feel feel lots of value in paying homage to artists who've done work before so not not like taking a design and then reinterpreting it but the story again yes. back to the, story, the story matters like this is this is what existed before this is what this person came up with this was why and let's try and figure out how they were thinking and let's go okay this is our story how it comes into it and growing off of that and in art and design those those stories and those discussions and and kind of recognizing the path along the way because we all are working on the shoulders of giants whether we realize it or not because you've had all this influx your whole life of things coming in that you process subconsciously and but that to me is important like the the story and where things came from and and good intent yes yeah, that's you're basically explaining what folk music is. <laughs> okay, so, um, oh, this one. I wanted to get on this one before we close things up a little bit. Right now, you are working on a miniature pair of boots I saw on your Instagram. You, you're sharing like little pictures of it. Can you explain this process and why you're making really small boots? So it's one boot and it okay. is one of my art projects. So similar to the, the razor blade boots, it's one of those. So I work on it at night and in my spare time. Um, it came about from discussions with a friend who said, you really need to, you, I spend like six months on one pair of boots. I, again, not super viable business model, but it is what it is and it's not changing. And she said, you need to make a, up, you know, keychains or something out of, your scraps you need something going small and i said no i'm, I'm not going to do that because that's just taking away time from the things that bring me joy to make and she said no you know you think of something that's you then if it's not those things think of something that's you and just a couple days of you know i kicking around in my head i i a bunch of little ideas i'd had in different circumstances and different contexts came together and i thought oh, i'm going to make this miniature miniature boot so it's not a child's boot it's a 44 percent scale i'll show you the last of of this mexican oh my one. gosh so it's an ex like as close as i could be a 44 percent, and then everything had to be scaled like the the um thickness of the leather going into it had to be super super thin like this really really thin lining is 44 percent down <laughs> from a wow thing. and the the stitches here, try to get them. The stitches would equate to 11 stitches per inch because smaller than that, it was just going to rip through. But um, so it was a, for whatever reason, something I felt I needed to make as like an art project. But also it is going to be like an Instagram giveaway when I'm all done to, you know, fulfill these ideas my friend had about about engaging people more with something that's made quicker than. So that's where that came from. <laughs> Cool. Well, everybody who's watching right now, definitely follow on Instagram um, because that's going to be a fun giveaway. Do you feel like you're l learning more 
because it's such a small design that you can bring to the bigger designs? I always feel like, like switching scales in anything really makes you think about things in unexpected ways. And for me, definitely architecture was that way. Like the, if, I, if I look back on why I wasn't drawing architecture, like the scale was too big. I, it, I was designing something which I love designing, but then someone else was building it. And I didn't have that kind of control. Like I have ultimate control in what I do right now of in the ways that I can control. You know, I, I design and I make them. I have only myself to blame for anything that doesn't work out. And, um, but changing scale to a human scale, the way boots are really a human scale on something that you work on right here in front of you. And that works for me. And changing to this really small, tiny scale where I did, you know, I need to use like tools to hold it because I can't use my finger to hold it while I'm skiving and things like that. It makes me start thinking about, you know, processes and how you work with your hands and what, you know, how you maintain your eyesight when you're working really close to things over years and years. And, you know, the, the aspects of what works at what scale. And, and it's exciting. I find that exciting. So I, I don't have end goals. I, to me, every day, the process of what I'm doing is the reward of living this lifestyle. That's great, man. That is the life right there. Um, I want to wrap things up a little bit here, but I want also for you to share with people how they can get boots from you, how orders work and like how long it lasts, maybe uh, starting prices and stuff like that. So how does that work for you? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty easy to get in contact with, whether it's through my website, my phone number's on there, my email address, through Instagram, the messages. Um, it starts with a discussion. Like, am I the right boot maker for you? Is what you're looking for the, my strength as a boot maker? And, and if it's not, I'll, I'll try to guide you towards somebody who would be the, the better boot maker for you. But we, you know, discuss, like, this is my process. What do you have in mind? What, where can we work together to develop the, the boot? I was going to say the product, but the boot. And um, that's where we start with these discussions. And then if it's a go, then I would measure your feet. You know, I, we, if you have a budget, I take that in mind for the design phase. I take a down payment for the design phase. And we talk materials and all those kinds of things. Um, I charge by the hour. So I keep track meticulously of how long everything, even the mini boot, takes me each process so I can get a good idea of how elaborate or not elaborate the design can be based on how long it will take me to do that. Like I know how long it takes me to hand embroider things. So, you know, for instance, I had a client with a budget who wanted far, far, far more elaborate. It was a pair of boots with Ivy on it. I don't know if you've seen the picture and it was way more elaborate than the budget. And we talked about it and she decided that it was worth more for her to get what she wanted. I, and so the, you know, she paid me more, but I put, it correlates, my prices correlate exactly to time and then the materials that I need to buy the boots and I use stock materials. So I can say my insoles are going to cost $80, you know, that's in there. So it just, um, the cheapest boot I could possibly make with straightforward leather that's not an exotic leather that costs more than, than usual is 3500 with no decoration anything like that so that's my starting price you know most of my boots are in the four to five thousand range the the ivy boots are the most expensive boots i made because they were just hundreds of hours of hand embroidery on them and so for a customer i mean the 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 knife boots would probably be more expensive right if you sold those they're just an art piece that's out there. They were supposed to be in a show in Boston in January, and then the gallery closed. <laughs> so That's I had sad. them praised and everything, and they're like, if any museum wants to buy them, they're, they're for sale. <laughs> I could not sell those boots for anyone to wear. You would be, you can't wear those boots. They, you, you would get cut. <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. I'm just, I'm just wondering how you would figure out how to put them on in the first place. <laughs> I have. I made them to my, my foot, so I can't put them on. And I can hold them. I know how to hold them without cutting myself. But I had written in my, when this gallery show was supposed to happen, I had it written in there that only I could even mount them on the display because I didn't want anyone to get hurt. Uh, you know, that's, that's not the intent. Right. <laughs> awesome. Sarah, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. Um, the website is Sabatuz. Bespoke. No, sabatuz.com. Sabatuz.com. 
and your Instagram is Sabatiz Bespoke, um, everybody has to follow you. Like seriously, the Instagram is so cool with the artwork and the pieces and the boot making that you uh, are 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 doing. It's it's just really cool. I'm a fan. And I'm glad that I live so close when this pandemic is all good, like in all over the phase like 17, I'm definitely coming to visit because I want to check out the 10 footer. Any Anytime. And thank you. Say, I really enjoy hearing about the love and appreciation of boots that, like you said, here in New England, I just don't get exposed to. And I just, I, I could spend all day reading all the comments from all your followers. And I just, I find it so enriching to my experience seeing how much people love these boots and why. So thank you. It's my pleasure. I absolutely love it too. And I love reading all the comments as well. So it's just the more boots out there in the world, the more passion for them, the better as far as I'm concerned. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Have a great rest of your day. And thanks everybody for watching. Thanks, Jeremiah. Peace. Have a good one.